Hi everyone, in this video of Accelerated Chess Dragon, we're going to be looking at another chess opening, and this is the Sicilian defense, and to be more specific, about the Alapin variation. So, white starts off by playing e4, and black goes c5, the Sicilian, and now c3 by white. And this is the Alapin variation, and what the Alapin usually tries to do is it tries to get this d4 move in for white. And what white tries to do with that d4 move is to simply control the center and uh, basically control the center with two pawns and then just develop from behind. So what is black going to do? Well, there are a couple of ways you can actually approach this variation. Uh, some of them include d5 and also just simply knight s6, attacking the e4 pawn in both scenarios. Uh, but in this case, what black is going to do is not necessarily worry about the e4 pawn, but instead go g6. And black is trying to fianchetto the bishop as early as possible. White does indeed go for d4, but now black takes the pawn, and after c takes d4, black goes for d5, trying to strike where white's central pawns are. And it makes sense, because if you can get rid of either the e or d pawns, then white's central control is not going to be as strong as it was before. So now e takes d5 is one move. Another move is just to maintain the pawns by playing the move e5. And we're first going to be looking at e5, which would result in bishop g7. And you might be asking yourself, why in the world would black play the move bishop g7? Well, yes, the bishop would be blunted from the pawn, but black is trying to play the move f6, and what f6 is trying to do is challenge the e5 pawn. And that e5 pawn is mainly the reason why black's dark squared bishop cannot get the best development. So with f6, black tries to challenge the pawn and simply get rid of it and then get more activity for their dark squared bishop. So white now goes knight c3 and is now putting pressure on the d5 pawn, but is also just developing the knight. And this is what I meant. White can simply develop the pieces from behind the pawns. After knight c3, knight c6 is played by black, and white goes for bishop to b5. With this bishop b5 move, white is, first of all, pinning the knight on c6 to the king, but at the same time is also getting ready to increase the pressure by playing moves like queen to a4. And then you can start seeing ideas like... Uh, maybe bringing this knight over to a4 and then to c5 first, and then bringing the queen out to a4. Uh, so what does black do? Well, you might be thinking that black should take care of this problem and then only start worrying about uh, the control that white has in the center. But no, black is going to go f6 right away. f6 is just trying to get rid of the very strong e5 pawn that is occupying most of the space in black's territory. Now, of course, there are two moves that white can choose from, which are ef6 and also f4. Uh, if you play the move f4, you're reinforcing the e5 pawn. However, with this f4 move, you also weaken a couple of squares around your position. Uh, notably, the light squares, like f5 and g4. So what is black going to do? Well, black is obviously going to take advantage of this and go knight h6. Now, what black is trying to do is to... Uh, put the knight on this f5 square. And after a couple of more moves, after essentially black unpins themselves from this bishop, by castling, for instance, then black is going to go knight f5, attack the d4 pawn, and essentially tie down all of white's pieces. And um, that's one way to go about the position. Another way is to simply bring this bishop out to g4, which could also be played. Uh, but more or less, black is going to want to put the knight on the f5 square. So, knight f3, bishop g4 is now played. And what is bishop g4 trying to do? Well, it's trying to put the knight on the f5 square, like I mentioned, break the pin, and then take the knight on f3, or just play knight takes d4, and assuming that white doesn't do anything about the pin, black might win some material because the knight on f3 is pinned to the queen. So now the bishop comes out to e3, reinforcing the d4 pawn. And yes, you could play knight f5 and attack the bishop with tempo, but white could just take the knight on c6 with check and then uh, retreat the bishop, so there's not really any pressure on d4. So instead, both sides just castle, and after knight f5, black's position could generally be said to be slightly better than white's, considering uh, the amount of development that black has. Uh, and later on, black will use the 
C file to their advantage and maybe later on take care of this tension that is building up in the center, mainly due to this E5 pawn. Uh, the other option is just to take on F6. And you might be thinking now black is going to take with the knight and develop the knight out. It turns out that's not the case and black is actually going to take with the pawn. Why would black think of playing E takes F6, you might be asking. I mean, they just blunted their own bishop. That too, they've now isolated the d5 pawn. But not only that, they didn't develop a piece out to f6. Well, it turns out that black has a certain setup that they're trying to go for. And they can kind of only achieve this with uh, this type of move order. Because black's plan is to bring the knight over to e7 and then to f5. When the bishop takes on f6, that's obviously not a very good move because although you are attacking the d4 pawn, white can easily defend it and then continue on with their own plan. And also, bishop f6 would block the knight in from getting developed. And the other problem that black is facing is they cannot really develop the knight out to h6 when the bishop goes to f6 and captures the pawn because the bishop on c1 is guarding the h6 square. And basically, what black tries to do is after e takes f6, white develops the knight out to e2, and now bishop e6. Not developing the knight out yet, but first building up with bishop e6. The knight comes out to f4, and black plays bishop to f7, simply guarding the d5 pawn. And this was another reason, because white's idea was to really maneuver the knight around in such a way that they could be pressuring this d5 pawn. And if white were to play something like queen b3, black is just in time to defend the pawn with the move knight e7, since you can't move this knight, it's pinned. So, white castles, black brings the knight out to e7, and now we have a trade of minor pieces on the c6 square. And now what black has done is now black is defending the d5 pawn. So, they're completely fine. But white has a bit of trouble defending the d4 pawn because it's an isolated queen pawn. And if you know anything about isolated queen pawns, then they are very easy targets if they are not moving. So what is black going to do? Black is going to go knight f5, queen b6, and then maybe castle and uh, later on build up against this d4 pawn. And eventually, the pawn is going to be captured, white uh, is going to be down a pawn, and it's an easy victory for black. Uh, so here, white goes knight a4, trying to get some counterplay. What is white's counterplay, you might be asking? Well, after castles, knight c5. And if you don't already see the threat, the move is trying to play knight c to e6 or knight f to e6. It honestly doesn't matter. Because you're forking both the queen and also the rook. And if the bishop takes, the other knight will just replace its counterpart. And then you lose the exchange, essentially. So black plays queen c8, simply defending the e6 square again. So now you cannot go knight e6, either knight. So rook e1, and now rook to e8. Defending the knight, although the knight could maybe want to have gone to f5, black has an idea with this. And although you are seemingly building up with a move like knight f e6, that's not really the plan that white is going for. Because if you do indeed decide to pop the knight into the e6 square, then black is happy to just take the knight on e6. And if you play knight e6 or rook e6, it doesn't matter which move, Let's say you go knight e6. Black is fine with just playing the move knight f5. And they're okay with giving up the bishop on g7. Because now let's say you take the knight. Rook takes e8. Uh, queen takes e8. And now you develop the bishop out. Black would be completely better. Uh, since you don't want to trade all of the pieces off. Because this d4 pawn is weak. And if you try going bishop to f4. Then black can simply go queen to e4. There's an attack towards this bishop. There's an attack towards the d4 pawn. There's no way to defend both of them without losing at least a pawn. So, if this were to occur, then white would be losing. And, of course, it doesn't just have to be uh, being forced to capture all of this. You indeed could play something like bishop to e3 and defend the d4 pawn. Uh, but black's not going to take the bishop on e3 because that's a very powerful knight and you don't trade it all of a sudden just for one bishop. That is not really that powerful. So black goes rook to e4. And the idea is to simply bring the queen out to a6, maybe even to e6. And then bring this other rook into the game via e8. And you get somewhat of an Alekhine's gun. And you're pressuring it all the way down to the end of the e-file. And essentially, 
With all that pressure, black is just going to uh, either make white very tied down, uh, or white is not going to make anything happen, and uh, they're just going to sit the rest of the game uh, not doing anything. And the main problem that is uh, present is that white cannot really defend the d4 pawn. The reason is because it's an isolated pawn, and you must defend it with the pieces. And there's only a certain arrangement of pieces that you can use that only defend the pawn. If you try defending the pawn in other ways, then obviously uh, there could be ways of taking advantage of this. And that's the main reason why white is a lot worse here. White cannot really defend the pawn in a favorable way that allows their pieces to also be active. Which is the main problem. Because this rook can just stay here attacking the pawn and then black can just build up towards this d4 pawn. So you don't necessarily want to play knight fe6 or just do any of that. Instead, what white does is go queen to d3. Now what they're trying to do is they're trying to develop the queen out and then slowly but surely defend the pawn, but try to keep the pieces as active as possible. Here, g5 is played, and g5 is not played just with the intention of trying to kick the knight away. It's actually trying to be played with the intention of trying to bring the bishop out to g6. Now, if you play this knight f to e6, then what is black going to do? Well, black is just going to play knight g6, and they have no problem here, because if you take the bishop, you get rook takes e1. So you can't take, but this knight on e6 cannot really be defended that easily, because now you're threatening bishop e6, and then rook e6, and you would win a piece. If you were to try something like queen f5 or queen h3, then the major problem lies within this move, knight to f8. And the amount of pressure building up towards this knight is the main reason why white is a lot worse here. The knight is threatening to being captured, and uh, you have really nothing that can actually stop this idea. And you can't really play knight g7, the rook is hanging, you can't really do anything, and after this knight f8 move, white is going to have to resign the game. So knight e2 instead, you bring the knight back, but now the bishop comes forward to g6. After the queen finally goes to c3, sidestepping all of the possible attacks that black could possibly have delivered, knight f5. Simple knight out move. And what this knight is trying to do is just simply go to f5, maybe later on go to d6, and then to b5. And, well, this knight has a lot of potential. It doesn't even have to go to b5. It could literally just stay on f5, and it's doing a very nice job. If this queen ever thinks of moving, let's say to c2, you always have ideas like knight d4, uh, if this queen moves away from the defense of the rook, I'm saying. And what is black honestly not have here? I mean, black is completely better, they have the open b file, they have the open e file, and with a couple of more moves, black can definitely prove that they're way, way better. So that was the move e5. Now we're also going to be taking a look at the move e takes d5, which trades the pawns off but gives white an isolated queen pawn. And black could just take the pawn on d5 right away. That's true. You could definitely take it. There's only one problem. White can just start developing the pieces behind the pawn. And after something like queen d5, knight c3, you would have to bring the queen back and white gets a significant amount of development. This kind of resembles the Scandinavian defense where white just gets the bishop out uh, to c4, black... Uh, brings the queen back somewhere like d8, a5, or d6. And basically, black has no way of actually proving himself any better than white. You can try developing, but after something like queen b3, and then just defending the pawn, white is completely fine here, and there's nothing wrong with the position at all. So, queen d5 doesn't exactly work. Instead, you have to try going knight f6, because now, if knight c3 is played, uh, this is the one move, you could also go for bishop b5 check, and we'll look at that in a second. Because if knight c3 is played, then knight takes d5. Bishop c4. And here, this is a very instructive position. What happens if black were to play the move knight takes c3? How should white respond here? Okay, so the correct answer is to actually play the move queen to b3, and it's very incredible, because what is white trying to do with queen to b3? Well, 
Here, if you play the move knight to e4, let's say you want to save your knight, then you're in a lot of trouble after bishop f7, king d7, and now queen to e6 check. You're most likely going to lose this knight, if not, maybe even more material. So you're forced to go to c7, and although you could check here and then pick up the rook, it wouldn't necessarily be the best position because now knight d6, queen h8, and now knight f7. Black has some material for the rook, and maybe black still has counterplay. I mean, if the queen doesn't defend the d4 pawn anymore, you have ideas like queen takes d4. The queen gets active, and it doesn't seem like white punished black at all for black's wrong play. Instead, you shouldn't just go queen e6 check, king c7, and then check here, because black has a way of surviving this after knight d6. Instead, what you must do is you should instead go for the move Queen takes e4. You should just take the knight on e4 like that. And black has not gotten a single piece developed. Look at it. Black doesn't have any pieces developed. White's pieces are already infiltrating into black's camp. And you see ideas like bishop f4, knight f3, rook c1. White has a lot of ways to continue and black is just simply lost here. So you simply cannot play the move knight c3. It just loses you the game like that. Instead... What you should do is you should just avoid capturing the knight and go knight to b6. You're attacking the bishop, and the bishop is a key attacker in many variations like this. So getting rid of it wouldn't be bad if white were willing to play queen b3 or something and then give up the bishop or queen d3. So you go bishop back to b3 as white. Black develops the bishop and is now attacking the d4 pawn, and white plays knight f3. And you might be wondering, can black go for the move bishop g4? Because, I mean, the knight is pinned, and when you take it and then capture on d4, you get an extra pawn. Well, the problem with bishop g4 is that now white can take on f7. And if you don't take the bishop, then you're simply down a pawn and your king side is very weak. But if you take the bishop, then there is knight g5 check. And this is the major problem with the position. Because now if you go back, let's say to g8, you lose the bishop. In fact, white also has ideas like queen b3, not at the moment, but later on. Uh, but in other situations, queen b3 could also be enough to win. Queen takes g4, however, and what is black going to do? You're threatening moves like queen e6. You're also threatening just developing the bishop out to e3, castling queenside. And black has no say in the position whatsoever. So bishop g4 prematurely is not the correct way to continue. Instead, you castle, and here, white has two moves to choose from. h3, and also to just castle kingside. If you go for the move h3, then you get knight c6, and now the idea is to attack the d4 pawn. The bishop goes to e3, and the knight now goes to a5. What is the knight trying to do when it gets to the a5 square? Well, it's actually just trying to go into c4, or at least eliminate the powerful b3 bishop. So, white has two moves to choose from, either castling or bishop c2. If the bishop goes back to c2, then knight a c4, and white's position all of a sudden becomes so passive. The bishop goes back to c1 and bishop e6. Black has all the pieces developed, not counting the queen, but look at white's development. White brought the bishop back to c1, this c2 bishop isn't really eyeing anything, and these knights are really pointless. Whereas if you look at black, black has a future attack on the b2 pawn if this bishop ever moves, and this knight also can come into d5, the rook can come to c8, and black has lots of potential here. White, on the other hand, does not. And this is the major problem. Let's say white castles, rook c8, rook e1, bishop d5. You're now having ideas of capturing on f3, and then winning the d4 pawn. So knight takes d5, but after knight takes d5, who is better here? If you said black, you're correct, because black has lots of ways of how to infiltrate into white's position. A couple of them being knight b4. Another one is perhaps queen to a5, and even queen b6, and then you're attacking the b2 pawn. White has so many weaknesses that black can easily target, and that's the major problem that white has. So many weaknesses. 
So you do not go bishop c2. You could instead castle, but that leaves your bishop hanging. And after a takes b3, you could play queen takes b3 as well, but that would allow bishop e6. And it's the same thing if a takes b3. You go bishop e6. You're going to seize the open c file after you defend the a7 pawn. Let's say a6 and then rook c8. And then you have future ideas of how to continue the position. Let's say knight takes d5, queen takes d5, and b3 is the next target that you're going for. So you can see how easy it is for black to target all of white's weaknesses. So instead of h3, you also have the option of just simply castling, which after castling would result in knight c6, d5, knight a5, rook e1, and black develops the bishop out to g4. Now there are ideas like taking on c3, taking the bishop on b3, and then capturing on d5, because those are the two defenders, minus the queen, that are defending the d5 pawn. And, well, the problem really lies within all of white's weaknesses, like I said before. So, that's why knight b6 is just going to allow black lots of counterplay after castles, and then there are choices between h3 and castles by white. But white doesn't really have any way of actually taking advantage of this position, whereas black really does. So uh, that is the one difference that separates these two uh, players. The other move we can look at is that instead of going knight c3 and allowing all of this, you could instead play bishop b5 check. And if bishop b5, then black blocks with knight bd7, and now they're threatening to take on d5. So what does white do? White does what any person would do and tries to defend the pawn. Black develops the bishop out, white goes d6. Why would white go d6? Well, because the pawn is eventually going to be lost. After a lot of building up, let's say, uh, b6, bishop b7, for instance, uh, even after castles, knight b6, and the pawn is going to be very weak. Which is the main problem, and it's the reason why white decides to play d6. Why does white go d6? Well, because now if you take on d6, then you also have an IQP, an isolated queen pawn, and, well, I mean, now it's basically an equal game. However, you're not going to just take the pawn on d6. Instead, you're going to castle. You're not going to worry about the pawn. After de7, queen e7, knight ge2. And now a6. And so what if you're down a pawn? Look at white's position. White has a very weak isolated pawn on d4, and black has lots of ways to easily develop their pieces. For white, it's not so simple. And that is the major difference between both sides. And after a6, black's idea should just be to continue on by playing b5, bishop b7, and get a lot of development very quickly. Because if you give white even a little bit of time to consolidate, then maybe that extra pawn could actually mean something. So after this a6 move, just continue with b5 and then bishop b7, bring the rook out, and then have a good game. So after the a6 move, that is the end of the variation, and I hope you all enjoyed the video, and if you have any suggestions or feedback for me, please let me know in the comments section, and stay tuned for more chess.